because we're close to Independence Day, I was asked to speak on that topic, <laughs> independence. So when I looked through Srila Prabhupada's books, I could find that Prabhupada addresses two broad categories of concerns regarding independence. One of them is the general independence of the living being trying to enjoy apart from Krishna in this material world. And the other one is the social independence of women in the modern world. <laughs> so I'm going to let you decide what you'd like to hear about. <laughs> Anybody have any? How many people want to hear about the independence of the jiva from Krishna? Raise your hands. I don't see any hands. <laughs> you have, this is participatory. <laughs> How many people would like to hear about women, uh, independence of women in the material world? <laughs> Two people. All right, I'm going to, since we're non-participatory today, I'm going to strike a compromise and read whatever I want to read. <laughs> <laughs> this is Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, and we have uh, chapter 18, text number 3. The topic of this chapter is Prithu Maharaj milking the earth planet. It's a very interesting, very interesting uh, section of the Srimad Bhagavatam. <coughs> so let us begin with auspiciousness, Mangala Charana. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Asmin loke vthava mushmin muni bhistatva darshibhi drishta yoga prayuktascha pungsam shrayat prasithaye Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. <clears throat> to benefit all human society, not only in this life, but in the next, the great seers and sages have prescribed various methods conducive to the prosperity of the people in general. Report. Vedic civilization takes advantage of the perfect knowledge presented in the Vedas and presented by great sages and brahmanas for the benefit of human society. Vedic injunctions are known as shruti, and the additional supplementary presentations of these principles, as given by the great sages, are known as smriti. They follow the principles of Vedic instruction. Human society should take advantage of the instructions from both Shruti and Smriti. If one wants to advance in spiritual life, he must take these instructions and follow the principles. In Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu, Srila Goswami says that if one poses himself as advanced in spiritual life but does not refer to the Shrutis and Smritis, he is simply a disturbance in society. One should follow the principles laid down in the Shrutis and Smritis not only in one's spiritual life, but in material life as well. As far as human society is concerned, it should follow the Manu Smriti as well, for these laws are given by Manu, the father of mankind. Now, since two people rose their hands about this topic, Krishna is evidently fulfilling their desire. In this Manusmriti, it is stated that a woman should not be given independence, but should be given protection by her father, husband, and elderly sons. In all circumstances, a woman should remain dependent upon some guardian. Presently, women are given full independence like men, but actually we can see that such independent women are no happier than those women who are placed under guardians. 
If people follow the injunctions given by the great sages, shrutis, and smritis, they can actually be happy in both this life and the next. Unfortunately, rascals are manufacturing so many ways and means to be happy. Everyone is inventing so many methods. Consequently, human society has lost the standard ways of life both materially and spiritually. And as a result, people are bewildered, and there is no peace or happiness in the world. Although they are trying to solve the problems of human society in the United Nations, they are still baffled. Because they do not follow the liberated instructions of the Vedas, they are unhappy. <clears throat> The significant words used in this verse are asmin and amushmin. Anybody who knows Sanskrit here, you know what these terms mean. Basically, it means in this one and in the next one. In this one and the other one. That means to say in this life, in this world, and also in the next life, next, next world. Asmin means in this life, and amushmin means in the next life. Unfortunately, in this age, even exalted professors and learned men believe that there is no next life and that everything is finished in this life. Since they are rascals and fools, what advice can they give? Still, they are passing as learned scholars and professors. In this verse, the word amushmin is ex very explicit. It is the duty of everyone to mold his life in such a way that he will have a profitable next life. Just as a boy is educated in order to become happy later, one should be educated in this life in order to attain an eternal and prosperous life after death. It is therefore essential that people follow what is given in the shastras, in the, I'm sorry, in the shrutis and the smritis to make sure that the human mission is successful. Om Agnana Timaranta Sikhnanan Jina Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tathmai Shri Guru Vena Don't judge anybody else and don't take too seriously anybody else's judgment of you. It's all inconceivable, this whole thing. Is that okay? Can I ask yes. a question? Yes, please. It's not on the same subject, okay. but it's closely related. Um, I've heard that um, not only the um, initiating a guru. I mean, the, the, the purpose of, of initiation, let's put it this way, um, by the guru is that um, it's very important because he gives the seed of devotion to the uh, uh, shisha. Um, I have heard, though, that also through um, shiksha, the Shiksha Guru can take you back home, back to God. So, I'm, I'm, of course, I know he can help you to go back home, back to God, but to actually take you back home to God, then this uh, seems to me that what he's saying about the Shiksha Guru has the same uh, uh, same purpose. Or the, well, of course, he has the same purpose, but he, he has the same ability as the uh, Diksha Guru. Because the definition of Diksha is transcendental knowledge, at least that's one definition. But, you know, the other definition is that you have to be accepted into the Sampradaya. Yeah. And that is a choice that is made by someone else. And so we need to recognize here that it's not just a question of enlightenment, it's also a question of sponsorship. Because that's the function of the... the, the you know, that's a function of grace. His divine grace. Yeah. When we say his divine grace, whose divine grace? Krishna's divine grace comes in the form of the spiritual master. And we need a sponsor for our soul. And initiation provides that, or rather, you know, uh, solidifies that. So, you know, we have this, this uh, convention since time immemorial. Even though... Diksha gurus and shiksha gurus are one and the same in their purpose and in their function, even. Uh, I mean, in, they're one in their purpose, but uh, the functions are slightly different. So, so then, um, is, it, is it so that a shiksha guru, rather than a diksha, 
Diksha Guru can take you home back to Godhead, in, the, in which case, if this is true, then uh, what is the point of initiation apart from the need for, for uh, deity worship? Say this again. Um, what is the point of initiation? If you're saying that, yes, what is the point of initiation if the Shikha <coughs> Guru can take you home back to Godhead? Um, yeah. Apart from the fact that you need Diksha for being able to do. Yeah, well, that, that I just said. The point is that you have to be accepted. And that has to be objectively demonstrated in the form of the spiritual master saying, yes, I will initiate you, or no, I will not initiate you. Yeah. And that acceptance is itself a function of grace. Because what are we doing here if we're not beseeching the grace of the Supreme Lord? And, you know, um, we have to ultimately come to that point of... Uh, begging for the Lord's mercy and accepting the Lord's mercy when he gives it. And it doesn't matter whether you get that from a Shiksha Guru or a Diksha Guru or from Krishna himself, you've got to come to that point of surrender. See, the, the, the Ritvik proposal obviates, or rather prevents, in fact, you know, the, you know, any scope for Sharanagati, this, this surrender like this. Because it de deprives the Guru of the authority or any voice in, in the matter. I, I decide that I want to get initiated by Prabhupada, or why stop with him? I mean, I want to be initiated by Rupa Goswami. When I was in college, I studied a poet who was, you know, said to be a disciple of Rupa Goswami, except that he was a century after Rupa Goswami left the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, the point is that it's a function of divine grace to confer upon a person initiation. We have in our line also the tradition that we can request Harinam initiation, but you cannot request Gayatri initiation. That has to be conferred because it's a function of mercy, His divine grace. And, you know, it's the answer to the question that will you please initiate me? Can, can I be accepted in the, the, the Sampradaya? If you get the mantra, then the answer is yes. If you don't get the mantra, the answer is no. But then, the Shikshikura can uh, complete that then. If, well, if Krishna wants, you don't have to have any guru. <laughs> if he wants, but we don't, we don't depend on that process, because that's, that's about as rare, in fact, it's even more rare than an honorary degree. People, people, you know, quite often get honorary degrees, especially nowadays when a degree means nothing. <laughs> but, you know, this is, this is a different thing. So what then, what's the fine, um, fine difference between the necessity of taking uh, a, a in effect, in effect, I only have one answer, and I'll give it to you for the third time: that it's to receive the mercy of Krishna in the form of his that that sponsorship for your soul through his devotee. Krishna is not very eager to accept the devotion of a person who will not take that step for whatever reason, and you know there are many examples of that as well. The, the mantra is there, one has to have the mantra, but the Gayatri mantra you can read in a book. You, you don't really have to go to a guru to get the Gayatri mantra, but the Shastra says, Sampradaya vihina ye mantras te nispalamata, your mantra will be fruitless if you get it from a book instead of from the guru, from the parampara. Yeah, I understand. So, this is the point. But then just a follow-up question then, is, um, given the history, the uh, this guy, at one point, we, uh, some of us experienced uh, losing gurus. Mm -hmm. So um, then a lot of us just continued under the shelter of Srila Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. But however, they were not uh, properly, properly initiated, um, because obviously the person who had initiated them uh, was not of the standard, the required standard. So, um, <clears throat> so then, it's a bit of a sticky question, but um, yep. then obviously that person, as they have always told us, should get so-called the initiation. So what of a person who is doing lots of wonderful service under the, uh, the banner of Sri Prabhupada's um, transcendental movement, but they are not um, uh, duly initiated by a Shikshi uh, there's a couple of things that I see here. Number one, I don't think we can assume that a person who was in good standing at one point 
or that we assume was in good standing at one point, and later fell, w was never in good standing. That's an assumption that I, I would not be prepared to make. And then the second thing is that a person who is initiated by a bona fide guru uh, who has fallen down, he, he still has the mantra, he still has the initiation. I, I don't see it in the Shastra that it is an imperative to take reinitiation from another guru. That is a convention that we have established in ISKCON, but I don't see that it's the only option. And I think we don't really recognize that it's not the only option often enough. That's my personal opinion on that. Is that okay? Well, uh, we could go into it more. Yeah, it's a, it's uh, a very sure deep, now, deep, deep topic. I'm not really satisfied with that answer. I understand what you're saying, but yeah. I think that we could, there are other <coughs> considerations. Yeah. At another time. Yeah. Anything else? Yep. Uh, so, when explaining about the quantitative description of Krishna and a living entity, Prabhupada says the only independence that a living entity has is choice. You mm -hmm. can choose whether to do something or not to do something. That's right. Does it belong only to the material world or also in the spiritual world we have only that independence? Well, uh, in a sense, you can say it works in either realm. I mean, the choice that we usually talk about is the choice to be either in the spiritual world or the material world. But, you know, we have a choice to, to act in the spiritual world, but we're going to act under the direction of one of Krishna's representatives. In the material world, we may do that or we may not do that. I mean, I, you can say even in the spiritual world, you may or may not do that. But you will no longer be in the spiritual world if you make the one choice, and you will remain in the spiritual world if you make the other choice. Okay. And it's the, it's the opposite in this world. You know. Okay, I think it's getting late now. So unless there are any other questions, we can stop. One more from His Grace Sachi Tanoi Prabhu. It's not a question, it's not a comment, I just want to request but if it's possible, since you're going to be only one month, I think, uh, we were having a Wednesday evening classes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Except it's your schedule to tie it up. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm very, I'm on a marathon right now. Oh, okay, then, then that's all right. Um, I'd love to have programs, but, uh, you know, I think we'll see how the work goes. Okay, so i go back to you. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much. All glory to Shri Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pungum Lankayate Girim Yat Kripa Tamaham Vande Shri Gurum Dinatarana. At one point in the sojourn of this short lifetime of mine, I found myself in the temple of Madan Mohan Deva in Karaulila, Rajasthan, reading the verses that were written on the wall there. And one of the verses was very beautiful. It said, it gave a nice comparison. Just as milk is all pervading throughout the cow, but is only accessible through the nipples of the cow. In the same way in human society, we have I mean, God is all-pervading all throughout his creations, both the material creation and the spiritual creation. God is there. Only God is there. Vasudeva Saravamiti, or if you prefer, uh, Saravam Kalavi Dam Brahma. But we, ex we can access the Lord through, specifically through the form of the deity. So although the Lord is all-pervading, he is accessible for us because we're conditioned and can't perceive him. Otherwise, he's accessible through the deity in the temple. And similarly, just as the cow, uh, actually, Srila Vishuddha Chakravarti Thakur, commenting on this verse, he gives this very analogy. He says, Gavam dukta purnat apyapinat upayena dohane naiva duktam labhyate. The same exact thing is being stated. You cannot drink 
the milk of a cow unless you get it out of the nipple. You, can you cut open the cow and try to get the milk? Maybe. But that's not the standard process. Then you get the sinful reaction called gohatya. And in exactly the same way, our material life is meant to be led in terms of the injunctions of the Shastras. In chapter 16 of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, anybody know the concluding verses? Yes, Shastra Vidhamutrijya Vartate Kama Karataha Nasa Siddhima Vatnoti Nasukham Naparam Gadim. If somebody whimsically just disregards what the Shastra has clearly en enjoined to do, or not to do, as the case may be, because there are two things in logic there's positive pervasion and there's negative pervasion. And to have both of them at the same time, that's called Anvaya Vyati Reiki, just like we hear in the seed verses of the Bhagavatam. Anvaya Vyati Reka Pya. So this, 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 this logic is there always in the Vedic injunctions. There's a positive injunction that you must do this. There's also an accompanying negative instruction that you cannot do that. Hmm? Just like when we come to Krishna Consciousness and take initiation in this International Society for Krishna Consciousness, what is the positive injunction that you, are, uh, you have to follow? You have to chant 16 rounds of the Hare Krishna Mantra. Those were initiated. And the negative, or the nishedhas, are what? No illicit sex, no meat-eating, no intoxication, no gambling. These are the things. So positive and negative. And generally we see throughout the Shastra that whenever there's a positive injunction, there's also a negative one. So these are all given in that vast body of literature that forms the, the main stream of all Sanskrit literature, which is called Dharma Shastra, or as Prabhupada says here, Smriti. The Smritis have been comp uh, composed by various sages in different times, place, and circumstances, but <clears throat> in f to follow the injunctions of the Vedas. So Shruti is the original four Vedas and Smriti means anything else that's Vedic. For example, is Srimad Bhagavatam Shruti or is it Smriti? It's a Smriti because it was written by Vyas as, as, a, as his own commentary on Vedanta Sutra. Arthanam Brahma Sutranam Jeev Goswami describes. So this is what Prabhupada is talking about here in this uh, purport. In fact, in the next couple of purports, I was skimming ahead. And not only the verses, the, the, the purports, but the verses themselves also emphasize this need. For example, tan atishtati asamyag upayan purvadarshitan avaraha shradhayo peta upayan vindatean jasa. One who follows the principles and instructions enjoined by the great sages of the past can utilize these instructions for practical purposes. Such a person can very easily enjoy life and pleasures. Raise your hand if you want to enjoy. There's a few honest people in the room. <laughs> so the purport Prabhupada writes, similarly, the Vedic principles, Mahajano yena gata sapantha, urge us to follow in the footsteps of great liberated souls. In this way, we can receive benefit in both this life and in the next. And we can also improve our material life. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you're interested in improving your material life, it's assumed. By following the principles laid down by great sages and saints of the past, we can very easily understand the aim of all life. The word avara, mean, meaning inexperienced, is very significant in this verse. Every conditioned soul is inexperienced. You ever feel inexperienced? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. It's as if we're just shoved down the tubes of time, one-way traffic, have no say in the matter, and don't even know what's going on most of the time, isn't it? We're inexperienced. Parabhavas davada bodhajato. It's therefore stated elsewhere in the Bhagavatam. As long as we remain in this conditioned existence, which is called a bodhajata, one whose knowledge has not been born yet. Uh, he's born without knowledge. Huh? Janmana jayate shudra 
Anybody know the rest of this verse? Samskara tu bhaved dvija. Veda parthat bhaved vipraha. Brahma jana diti brahmana. The brahmana is the person who actually knows what is the nature of spirit and he only identifies with that spirit. In other words, he's realized aham brahmasmi. That's called brahma bhuta realization in Bhagavad Gita. And uh, less than that, one can be called a vipra if he's a learned scholar. If one is simply twice initiated, then he's called dvija. And otherwise, if someone is simply born, then he's called a bodhajata, born without knowledge. In other words, shudra. It's an interesting, I don't want to get too far afield here, but Shankaracharya, I believe it's in his commentary on Bhagavad Gita, he's described what is the etymology of the word shudra, meaning somebody who's always crying. <laughs> He's always whining and complaining. Right, therefore, the Brahmin is somebody, na shochati. He's not crying. Neither is he kangshati. So in other words, there's no ignorance and there's no passion. To, to whine and complain and cry about things is, is to be ignorant. That's tamoguna. And to constantly hanker after things or be busy to get them, that's passion. Brahman is in the mode of goodness. And sattvat sanjayate jnanam. This is the characteristic of situation in sattva guna. He has awareness. An awareness particularly of his own identity. That's called Brahma Buddha jnan. So when he's steeped in that jnan, then only he's called a brahmana. But uh, the idea here is that such perfected brahmanas, like whom? Like Yajna Valkya Rishi, especially Manu, uh, the father of mankind, as Prabhupada said. In fact, even in the Shruti Mantra, there's one passage that says, whatever Manu says is medicine. That is an endorsement in the Shruti itself, which means that Manu is also eternal. It's something to think about. Anyway, these great sages have given us these uh, regulations for how to live, even in this world. So Prabhupada said, if we don't take advantage of that and remain inexperienced, then, he says here, everyone is a bodhajata, born a fool and rascal. In the democratic government at the present moment, all kinds of fools and rascals are making decisions, but what can they do? What is the result of their legislation? They enact something today just, as, just to whimsically repeal it tomorrow. One political party utilizes a country for one purpose, and the next moment, another political party forms a different type of government and nullifies all the laws and regulations. This process of chewing the chewed, punaha punash charavata charvanana, will never make human society happy. In order to make all, humans, uh, all human society happy and prosperous, we should accept the standard methods given by liberated persons. On the other hand, as Krishna tells us in Bhagavad Gita, that means a foolish person who manufactures his own ways and means through mental speculation and does not recognize the authority of the sages who lay down unimpeachable directions is simply unsuccessful again and again in his attempts. That's what we mentioned already. Parabhava. Parabhava means defeated. Or what does Krishna say about this in Bhagavad Gita? Anybody know? Moha Asha, Moha Karnamano, Moha Jnana, Abhicheta Saha, Dyadi. His, his activities are always defeated, his knowledge is defeated, everything he sees, it's lost. He can't be successful. In other words, Nasukham na Param So, purport here is even more strident, Prabhupada writes. At the present moment, it has become fashionable. Let's all turn off our cell phones, please. At the present moment, it has become fashionable to disobey the unimpeachable directions given by the acharyas and the liberated souls of the past. Fashionable. Especially in India, it seems. Isn't it? Have you noticed? It's almost as if they go out of their way to be offensive sometimes. Uh, I mean, there's so many things I could say, but <clears throat> that's maybe another class. <clears throat> Presently, people are so fallen that they cannot distinguish between a liberated soul and a conditioned soul. A conditioned soul is hampered by four defects. He's sure. 
to commit mistakes. He is sure to become illusioned. He has a tendency to cheat others, and his senses are imperfect. Consequently, we have to take direction from liberated persons. This Krishna consciousness movement directly receives instructions from the Supreme Personality of Godhead via persons who are strictly following his instructions. Is everybody here liberated in this way? I mean, should we, or do we have any doubts about this? Or any questions? We, we should. <laughs> we should wonder about this. So Prabhupada addresses those doubts. He says, although a follower may not be a liberated person, if he follows the supreme liberated personality of Godhead, his actions are naturally liberated from the contamination of the material nature. Lord Chaitanya therefore says, by my order, you may become a spiritual master. One can immediately become a spiritual master by having full faith in the transcendental words of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and by following his instructions. Materialistic men are not interested in taking directions from a liberated person, but they are very much interested in their own concocted ideas, which make them repeatedly fail in their attempts because the entire world is now following the imperfect directions of conditioned souls, humanity is completely bewildered. Just like we've been reading in the Bhagavatam elsewhere in the 8th canto, when we had this Samudramantan Lila, the Devas on one side pulling Vasuki and the Asuras on the other side pulling Vasuki, what happened to the Asuras? If you know the plot, then you know. They were repeatedly baffled in their attempts. Their attempt was what? They wanted to get the nectar. They wanted to get all the precious things that came out of the ocean, including Lakshmi Devi herself. <laughs> this is the nature of the demon, witness Ravana. <clears throat> but they were completely baffled. For example, at first the devas, they took hold of the mouth of the serpent, and the asuras became envious, naturally, because that's what asuras do. They become envious. So they said, no, 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 we should get the head of the snake. Okay, take it. So when they started pulling on the snake, naturally you pull on a snake, the snake gets agitated. <laughs> and he started breathing hot fire and started roasting all these asuras. The, through their own volition, by their own choice. This is called parabhava stavad abodhajat. <coughs> they don't know what they're doing, but they won't listen to someone who does, Therefore, they get roasted repeatedly. Mogha sha mogha karnamanu. And Krishna goes so far as to say in Bhagavad Gita that tanaham bhishataha kruran sangsareshnu radhama. Even if they're the sophisticated fools, <laughs> because there are very learned fools in this world, uh, I just throw them down because they're just, they can't be helped sometimes. You cannot help certain people because of the stringency of the laws of karma that condition them. So we're all in this category, actually, to one degree or another, and we need to recognize that. This is the point. So Prabhupada is pushing on this point. The way to actually become... Do we have Bhagavad Gita? The way to actually become dependent is to become... or independent is to become dependent. This is an irony. In chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita, text number 64, Krishna kind of hints this, and Prabhupada's uh, translation especially brings it out. <clears throat> he says, uh, he's just discussed how what happens when we contemplate the sense objects, and then we decide to do something about it, and then we get the reaction, and then we get angry if it's frustrated and can't get the reaction. Either way, it ends in parabhava. Um, and then we get angry and frustrated and bewildered and buddhinashat pranashyati, one falls down again into the material pool. This cycle, I think you know. So text 64 says, ragadvesha muktai tu. However, those who are freed from this attachment and repulsion, vishayan indriyaishcharan, that the senses will wander over all their objects. Atma vashyair vidhe atma who are able to control themselves, 
vidhyatma, because they're completely infused with the spirit of following the vidhis. Vidhyatma means somebody who is consonant or sympathetic with vidhi. Vidhyatma. It's a very, very loaded word here. So what happens to him? Prasadam adhikachati. He gets prasadam. He gets the mercy of the Lord. Prasade saravadukhanam hanir asyopajayate. And for him, all the miseries of material existence are destroyed in that state of grace. Prasade means in a state of grace. Prasanna cheta sohi ashu buddhi pariyavatishtate. And his intelligence remains fixed. So, back to Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary on this verse, he also mentions, he's basically paraphrasing Sridhar Swami, who wrote similarly. Uh, amushmin, uh, he says, Amushmin loke uh, krishyadayaha. In this world, we are to learn such things as agriculture from our forefathers, from the sages, from the Vedic literatures that deal with these things. Everything is given in the Vedic literature, and we're to learn everything from that Vedic literature, not outside. Therefore, what a shame it is that most of the people in this world who have traditionally, in their family lines, been brought up in this great knowledge, they've decided to learn C++ instead. <laughs> or they've become doctors or entrepreneurs. or, In effect, they've become... I can say some things that Prabhupada said, but I, I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> Prabhupada said them that enough said. So he says, in this world we learn things like this from the great sages. And Amushmimscha, in the next word, loke agniho tradayaha trishtaha priyokta anushtitascha. That means that things such as agnihotras and the ways, the ways that we perform sacrifices, the way it's seen to be engaged in. Pryukta means also appropriately. Anushtita. What does anushtita mean? Anybody know what anushtan means? We use this word sometimes in vernaculars, correct? Anushtan means shishtachara, right? The way you do something, a, a, a conventional practice or, a, or a, a tradition even, you might say. The way things are done. Now Prabhupada has stated in his purport here very clearly. <clears throat> and he's the one frustrating us. Wow. <laughs> Once you realize this, then you're either out or you're in. And sometimes it takes 20 years. 20 years a person can be <laughs> chanting Hare Krishna, but once he figures out that, you know, this is not all about me. <laughs> Then he has got, he's got to make a decision, you see. One of my godbrothers gave a very nice analogy. He says, just like when you're in a skyscraper building. Prabhupada used to call them skyscrapers. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, go, when you want to go to the top of a skyscraper building, let's say you go to the 70th floor. We're in New York City, Manhattan. Or Empire State Building, we can say. So you're in the elevator, you can't walk up that many stairs. You have to take the elevator. Now, when the elevator reaches your floor and the door opens, what do you do? You make a choice. You can stay in the elevator if you want. Or you can step out of the elevator, right? But you're going to make a choice. How many people stay in the elevator? You see? You're going to do something. So. In spiritual life, when we purify the consciousness of all this dross of passion and ignorance, at some point there will be a wake-up. That's called bodhajata. <laughs> when, you're, when your intelligence awakens to the actual situation, just like this morning we were hearing from Jayadvaita Swami, what happened to one ancient king in Jerusalem. <laughs> you know, his intelligence was agitated by the things that he knew to be true. And he had to make a decision. We, we, I don't think we're told there in what, what happened and you know, what decision he made. But the point is that everybody has to make a decision. Ultimately, Krishna consciousness is uh, it's a decision. But it's a decision that 
that, uh, that reifies itself at every moment. <laughs> at every step we make the decision. Okay, the context has changed now. How, how am I going to choose Krishna over Maya in this new context? You're, you're dealing with a constantly morphing situation. Now you understand why the Dharma Shastras are so variegated and so voluminous. You, to, to try to cover all the bases, you have to think of as many contexts as you possibly can and what to do in them. You see? But the basic principle is very simple. Be dependent. If you are dependent on God, then he will take care of all of your needs, and then you can do anything you want. That's independence. You see? When a child is walking down the street holding the hand of his father, he doesn't mind going up to another person and slapping him. <laughs> because he knows, my father is here to protect me. You see? I mean, we're not, <laughs> we're not endorsing that, but... You know, the protection of the Lord is there. Sthitir vaikunta vijaya poshanam tat anugraha. We're taken care of by the Lord. Yoga chimam bahami, he says. Is that okay? Or do you want more? No, that's okay. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> Destination of a person who conducts devotional service, but does not perform acts of charity. No, very good point. What is the condition of a person who performs devotional service but does not conduct acts of charity? Well, in some sense you can say devotional service is charity. <laughs> You're giving to God. I mean, it's a charity, it's not, it's, it's a charity, and it's a funny sort of charity, I suppose, you could say, but because we're actually giving, you know, we're actually acting in our constitutional position. But devotional service means, as we've been describing, to follow the injunctions that are given by Krishna. Service actually means to do what, to please the Master. And to please the Master, we have to do what the Master asks. How many people in India, you know, you, you, servants are very common in India, so what happens if uh, you ask the servant to do something and the servant just looks at you? <laughs> you fire the servant. So that's what happened to all of us, that, to answer your question, where our desires came from. We, we got thrown into this world, and then that's, uh, you know, there's prakshepatmika shakti, and then there's the avaranatmika shakti of maya. Once we're in this world, then we become swallowed up by it, and then we're just totally bewildered. But uh, to get back to your question, Krishna says twice in Bhagavad Gita, yajna dana tapaschaiva pavanani manishinaha, that sacrifice, charity, austerity, these things are never to be given up. Netyajyam. They purify even great souls. Pavanani manishinaha. Now, ch sacrifice, charity, and austerity do not necessarily have to be different from devotional service, and in fact they should not be. But one has to perform these things, otherwise the heart will not be purified. And this is another reason that Krishna has indicated when he says, uh, you know, jananam punya karmanam, He's talking about the people who sustain in pure devotional service. They're the people who perform sacrifice, charity, and austerity. Otherwise, the heart doesn't get purified and you cannot sustain the pure bhakti. This is the point. Without being punyatma, without being pious, you cannot sustain pure bhakti. This is the point. So, the, the question is whether we see these things as being separate from devotional service or not. And ultimately, I think... Um, you know, I mean, it depends on the spiritual master. We have to take shelter of someone who has vision that we lack. And uh, that person can guide us. You know, whether our charity, whether our sacrifice, whether our austerities are properly placed and properly directed. Is that okay? But they have to go on. <laughs> okay, anything else? You, you say that charity and, um, and austerity even the great souls. But what way would that be... Um, purifying for a nichasita. Well, the, the fact of the matter is that we're always refining ourselves. We're always purifying ourselves. Purification in the sense of refinement. 
It's kind of like this. In Bhaktivedanta Samrit Sintu, <coughs> Rupa Goswami describes three kinds of completion or three kinds of perfection. He says there's perfection, first of all, Purna. Then there's greater perfection, Purnatara. And then there's the best perfection, which is Purnatama. <laughs> so you can't say that any of them is not perfection. But even within perfection, there's, there, the point is that there's variegatedness. Within our perfection, we retain desires, and we retain activities, and we retain personality, and we retain, uh, you know, these sacrifice and charity and penance, and they always purify us. Even in the purified state, they, they still purify us. Um, it's kind of like somebody thinks that, well, if I go back to Godhead, then I don't need a guru anymore. But anyone who's been in Krishna consciousness long enough knows that we always take shelter of gurus even in the spiritual world. Even the gopis have their gurus. And we're always learning new things in devotional service. It's, it's a never-ending process. Is that okay? Um, yeah. Anything else? Okay. You're kind of almost raising your hand. Yeah, because it's not really related. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, when we sing the Tulsi prayers every morning, we always, it's completely about, you know, like, the uh, spiritual world and serving Krishna and, and uh, it's been down the mood, but why do we always say Krishna is Krishna? Oh, this is a perennial one. <laughs> yeah, this is a perennial one. You know, I cannot find that verse in Hari Vilas or in any authority outside of the letter in which Prabhupada wrote it, but he did. So, you know, that I, I put that in my file with, along with Namaste Saraswati Deve, which according to Sanskrit grammar, you, you can't really, you know, it doesn't really sink that well. It's what he said. Therefore we accept, and that's an authoritative approach even though, you know, we'll have to scramble to convince somebody who doesn't have faith in our spiritual master. I, I mean, I think it's safe to assume that Prabhupada got this mantra from some, you know, traditional source that's bona fide, so we don't really have to worry about that. And either, either way, Krishna and Vishnu are not different, so, you know, maybe it's only to, uh, to emphasize that oneness that in the neophyte stage we really need to focus on more than any so-called transcendental distinctions. Because when we're not liberated and try to make distinctions between the different forms of the Lord according to rasa, you know, we don't understand rasa for the most part. And therefore, we just, thereby, we just create an offensive situation. But that's a separate topic altogether, just like your question. So, is that okay? Yes. Uh, from a materialistic perspective, it seems like uh, independence or freedom that we call is more related to not feeling pain and sorrow, because we never say we want freedom from happiness. Right. But when you say dependent on Krishna to become independent from a liberated perspective, it means we've gone past and transcended uh, sorrow and pain on happiness. What is that state of being independent in a spiritual perspective? Not sure I understand the question. Um, being in this material platform, for me, freedom means I don't want, I want, I don't want to be free from pain and sorrow. Freed from what? That's the question. So yeah. Freed from misery. Misery, yes. Yeah. But uh, when, you, when we go back, being spiritual, that means that we're not attached to any of these sources of miseries. Right. And being independent in that state means what? Well, being independent then means that. Independent also means you can do what you want. You're not, you're not, you know, you're not restricted. Like a dog has his leash, and he can only go as far as that leash is. So he's, he's restricted, you know. So independent also means, you know, to be freed from these modes of material nature, freed from these four defects that restrict our activities and our consciousness and awareness in so many ways. You know, that's, that's the independence. A person in spiritual... A liberated person, if you will, is a person who can basically go anywhere and do anything in that consciousness because he's, he's not going to be in, uh, obstructed any longer by maya. Maya only obstructs those persons who are entertaining a concept that has no basis in reality. 
Those people who embrace her illusions are the ones that she obstructs, <laughs> because that's what she's intended to do. It's planned obsolescence, you see. Once you step outside of that paradigm, then you have full scope to do whatever you like. And whatever you like is what you like, and not what the modes like for you. This is another point. In this material world, what we think that we like is actually what the modes prefer for us to do. Right? Or what our karma impels us to do. It's not actually what we want to do. We don't even know what we want to do. And exactly, therefore he said, we have no idea of what independence is. <laughs> we don't know anything. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. In Bhagavad Gita, it's mentioned that like, uh, we have to take multiple words, so many words to reach God had. Well, not that you have to, but generally it happens. Okay. So, the question is like, uh, so at least in this year, let's say that I'm convinced that, okay, I have to do this chanting to progress in the spiritual life. Now I take the next word. So I do not know, like, uh, will, I mean, it says like you will start at the point where you left, but is there any guarantee, like I will progress it in the same momentum, or? Uh, well, I think you're asking that since Krishna says that, or he implies that wherever we leave off in this life, we begin the next life, but is there any guarantee that you're going to have the same inspiration to do that? There actually is no guarantee. Okay, you can fall down. That's, if you want to, you can fall down, if you're not yet perfect. So, you know, but you will, you will begin from the point that you left off. But what you do at that point of beginning, that's up to you. It's a free will is an eternal part and parcel of what we are. So sometimes I feel like, okay, now it's not, the process is not the energy at all. Yeah, so why so should I waste time with it? No, no. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, well that's, that. I, you know, I hate to put it so bluntly, uh, and there's no polite way to throw a hand grenade, but that's called envy. <laughs> that attitude is called envy. Because, you know, we've got other priorities that we actually prefer, and, you know, if, I, if I'm not going to get anything out of this, then, then I'm out of here. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's not what you're saying, I, I know that, but, you know, this is, this is the trajectory of that, of that, of that idea that you're, that you're stating. And it's not a good one. We, we have to be awakened in knowledge. And we, we have to see that it is on our own self-interest to get in touch with reality, because we're not in touch with reality. We will be frustrated at every step as long as we're choosing something that is a dharma instead of dharma. You got that? Is that clear? Maybe the last I mean, your, your, your question is predicated on the assumption that I'm, I'm, putting through, I'm putting a lot of hard hours into this, and I may, you know, I may lose it all at some point in the future. Well, make sure you don't lose it. I mean, you can say this in your company. You can say this, you know, you step outside the door. There's no guarantee you're coming home for dinner tonight, right? There's no So why do it? Why, why carry on with me, your materialistic life? It's no different. There's no guarantee of anything. There's no security. But if you are awakened in your spiritual consciousness, that cannot be taken away from you once you are awakened. I mean, at some point along the way, you, you may fall down. But, you know, this is also mercy we have to consider. It's not a hard, cold, mechanical process. There's a person behind this. And he's the most merciful person in all of existence. You know, so we have faith that, you know, having thrown all caution to the wind, so to speak, and, you know, put in my lot for this cause of Krishna consciousness, if I don't make it... Vedic civilization takes advantage of the perfect knowledge presented in the Vedas and presented by great sages and brahmanas for the benefit of human society. And he also says... One should follow the principles laid down in the Shrutis and Smritis, not only in one's spiritual life, but in material life as well. In chapter 16 of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is mentioning both the demoniac qualities, that's what he tends to dilate on more, as if he knows what's relevant most of the time. But he also talks about the godly qualities, and does anyone remember what some of those godly qualities are? 
abhayam sattva samshuddhir. The second thing he mentions, sattva samshuddhi. What does sattva samshuddhi mean? That's a big hard word, isn't it? I don't expect anyone. Sattva is a word that has, it means many things. It's generally we think of sattva guna, right? Actually, sattva means anything that exists. Sattva. Anything that has existence, or sat, it's called sattva. <laughs> so, sattva sam shuddhi to, means to completely pure, complete purification of your existence. Samyak shuddhi. Complete purification. So what is that complete purification? That you, you purify the mind and the body. And even the society that you live in, for that matter. Or the environment, for that matter. Because we can do the, other, we can do the opposite as well, isn't it? There are only two things in this world of activity in human society. There are only two things. One of them is called dharma, that which sustains. And the other one is called adharma, that which disrupts. These are the only two things that exist in the active world of human society. According to Baladev Vidyabhushan in his commentary on Bhagavad Gita. So, sattva samshuddhi therefore means we purify the whole thing. <laughs> we purify our mind and our body. Because you, can you purify the soul? The soul is already pure, is it not? So what is there to purify then when we speak of sattva samshuddhi? You can only really purify the mind and body, and you do that by following the injunctions and the prohibitions and the shrutis and the smritis. This is the idea. And therefore, in Vishnu Purana, when uh, Sagar Maharaj uh, requests his guru, how can I bring my subjects to pure Krishna consciousness? A concern that we all in Iskand should share with that king, right? We're concerned about empowering people to accommodate and sustain a mature commitment to pure devotional service. So his answer is quite long, but uh, within his answer is one verse that Prabhupada quotes repeatedly throughout his books. Varna shama charavata purushena parapuman ityadi. That the only way you could, an ordinary person can approach Bhagavan Vishnu is by becoming pious through dharma, and particularly the Varnashram dharma is probably the main one. Because when you become pious in this way, then if you get mercy, you can respond to it. Yesham tuantakatam papam jananam punyakarmanam te dvanva moha nirnamukta bhajante mandrihavrtaha Krishna says those persons who worship me with firm determination are the ones who have become freed from the illusions of duality and who are fixed in pious behavior. In other words, they are vedhyatma, as we've already dis described. They're pious. Piety, or dharma, can sustain a thing, because dharma by nature, the, the root of the word dharma is dri, which means to sustain. Therefore, sometimes it's also stated, dharma, what is it? Dharma rakshati rakshita, or dharma rakshati rakshita. Somebody who protects dharma is sustained by it, we might say. So this is the point of these verses. <clears throat> and independence means uh, one is only entertaining the illusion that there's something better to do than this. Because as soon as you step outside of the realm of what is enjoined in shastras, or prohibited by shastras, that is to say, whenever you step away from dharma, you can only have what? A dharma. That's your only choice. This is the only choice. So we all have a material life, and we should think about that material life and how to purify it. It's a very complex, sophisticated, comprehensive process. This is the thing. Actually, the Dharma Shastras are so vast because they guide us in our every waking moment. Everything from how to properly dress a wound to how to treat children, or how to put on a dhoti, or how to worship the deity, or as he said here, perform a hotra. Okay? So when Prabhupada says in his purport here, the very you know, <clears throat> simple thing, Vedic civilization takes advantage of the perfect knowledge presented in the Vedas and presented by great sages for the benefit of human society, how does it actually do that? How does it actually do that? It does that through anushtan. 
traditional behaviors that we learn via parampara. It's called shishtachara as well. In the Purvimi Mamsa Sutras of Jaimini Rishi, one of these great sages, he describes that for something to be considered Vedic tradition, it has to meet certain criteria. It has to be ancient. It has to be uh, acknowledged by great sages and brahmanas. It has to be pr practiced by them with uh, the understanding that it is such. It has to be promoting, at least to a higher position in the next life, if not towards liberation altogether. It cannot be uh, in uh, contradistinction to what the Shastra teaches. Uh, and, it, and it cannot be, uh, what is the word, jugupsitam, means uh, it cannot be abominable, mor morally reprehensible, we might say. I don't remember all of them. There's a list he gives, but this is the point. So Shishtachard has to be tested along these grounds, and we have to, therefore, learn what we can while we can. Because it only takes one generation of neglect to wipe out thousands and millions of years of cumulative wisdom and knowledge and culture and, and civilizational attainment. One generation of neglect only and then you end up with a motor speedway for Formula One racing south of Noida. <laughs> or vast ocean, oceanic uh, apartment complexes that look just like Orange County. When you drive towards the Vrindavan on the Yamuna Expressway nowadays, you don't really think, you, don't, you have to pinch yourself and remind yourself that you're not in America because uh, it looks just the same. What happened to all the Anushtans? What happened to all the Prasada? Prasada Sarvadukhanam Hani. What happened to it? And everybody suffers. Everybody knows the pollution levels in Delhi. I mentioned the other day, in case you don't know, uh, 20 times the governmental uh, uh, you know, limit on carcinogens and other heavy metal contamination and pollutants that are allowed to be put into that river. 20, 20 times beyond that, they've already exceeded. And this is 15 years ago. God only knows what they're doing now. There are people who keep track of these things. You can see the website, uh, saveyomunad.org, in case you're interested, which you probably should be. Anyway, so we take advantage of the perfect knowledge presented by the sages and uh, as described here uh, through the regulative principles of freedom, Prabhupada says in text. 64. A person free from all attachment and aversion and able to control his senses through regulative principles of freedom can obtain the complete mercy of the Lord. So, this is the process of Krishna consciousness. The substrate of Krishna consciousness is to be elevated to a certain level of sattva guna at least. Otherwise, we cannot sustain it. This is the point. Manushyanam sahasreshu kaschit yadati siddhaye yadatam avisiddhanam kaschin maam veti tattvataha. We heard this morning that uh, many hundreds, thousands of people who try for this spiritual perfection, hardly one becomes perfect in any way. And even of those who are perfect, uh, hardly one, Krishna says, can understand me. In fact, it's not very easy, this is the point. So the first task, therefore it's mentioned in the beginning chapter here, is raga dvesha vimukte. One has to become free from raga and dvesha. I mean, we can, in the broadest sense, maybe we can interpret those as, again, passion and ignorance. You know, or kangshati and shoshati. We have to become free from the modes of passion and ignorance. And situated in sattva guna, then our efforts to practice bhakti yoga will become fruitful, most fruitful. This is all described in the second chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, and we're very fortunate because we have an express way of our own in Krishna consciousness how to attain these things, and that is hearing and chanting about Krishna, especially hearing this Hare Krishna Mahamantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And also, in order to guide the pure enthusiasm that is generated from this holy name. Because we may have pure intentions, 
but without knowledge, we don't know how to engage those intentions. There are many godly people in this world. They are ready to give up their lives for God by flying jetliners into skyscraper buildings. But that is tamasic. It is not guided by knowledge. Therefore, we also hear from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Srimlatam Sukata Krishna Purnya Shravana Kirtana. And this Kirtan, this Shravan and Kirtan combination, this will make you Punya. It will make you Punyatma or Vetayatma, as we described already. And it will make you also Dvanva uh, Moha uh, Nirmukta, uh, freed from the illusions of uh, material existence. So this is the great mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu via his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, that we have an opportunity to take advantage of this process. I'm going to stop here, but if anybody has any questions or comments, we can discuss them. You were saying about how important Shaman Kirtan is for us to be susceptible, but how, how much do the things around us and what we do on a daily basis? We did touch on this at the beginning, but could you uh, talk more, more broadly or more uh, very straightforward way about how this is actually affect our soul, what we eat, how our mode of life is, and uh, the things that we associate with through smelling and hearing that are around mm -hmm. us? I've mentioned this several times. I'll just repeat your question I, if I've understood it correctly. You're asking, in effect, that we know that by hearing and chanting about Krishna, we become elevated in bhakti yoga. And to facilitate that practice, we also have to monitor our association very carefully and try to stay within sattva guna. For example, we have to watch what we hear and what we see and what we eat and what we, all the things we do, correct? Okay. So, sangat sanjayate kama. Your desires are the aggregate of all the things that you have spent most of your time associating your consciousness with. That means what, whatever goes in your ten organic senses and is processed in your head or your heart, and whatever you latch onto of those things, that is the thing that's going to determine what you desire. And what you desire, we've also gone through those verses in the Bhagavad Gita here just prior to this one that it's going to determine what you're contemplating, what you get attached to, what you therefore desire, what you ultimately do, and what you, uh, you get the reactions for. Or if you can't do it, what you get frustrated and angry about. You see? So, therefore, the 11th canto, this is described at length in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna is expanding on Bhagavad Gita there. He instructs Uddhava that Unless and until one has actually come to the stage of ruchi, we know from Rupa Goswami that bhakti yoga practice has various stages. In the beginning there's faith, then there's good association, then there's bhajan, and then there's anarjanivritti, the process of purification that we've mentioned. And then you become fixed, and when you become fixed you get a little bit of a ruchi. You see? Ruchi means this real taste. So until we're absolutely fixed in bhakti yoga like this, Krishna tells Uddhava, we have to very carefully follow the injunctions of the shrutis and the smritis, just as this purport that we've been discussing is telling us. And, you know, we can go into detail, but that's a topic that we might call dharma metaphysics. And it deals with the relationships of all things in this world, and the effects that they, the causes and effects of all things in this world, but the logic given in Bhagavad Gita only goes so far. When Krishna says, Karnamano uh, yapi bodhavyam bodhavyasya vikarmanaha, akarmanasya api bodhavyam, gana akarmano gatihi. He says, whether you're talking about action or you're talking about inaction or sinful action, the ins and outs of this is extremely complicated, and that's the process that I've described already. It leads to the, to the creation of Dharma Shastra that try to take abstract principles and translate them into ground-level reality on a practical day-to-day -day basis for everybody. So therefore it says, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you should do is look at your hands. <laughs> Why? Karagrevasate Lakshmi, Karamadhyay Saraswati, Karamolita Govinda. Prabhate karadarshanam. This is the traditional shloka. In your fingertips there's Lakshmi. In the middle of your hands is Saraswati, and at the root of your hand is Govinda. <laughs> and we purify our consciousness. 
Hari Bhakti Vilas says that one who says Om Madhusudanaya Namaha, when he rises first thing in the morning, that person will go back to Godhead. You see? When you step on earth, you will pray for forgiveness, because earth is, she's also called what? Bharati. Talking about sustenance and dharma, who is the one who maintains all of us? Earth, Bharati. She bears everything, except for a liar. <laughs> Eighth canto says that she cannot bear. Um, how we bathe, what we eat, this is described at some length in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, how we sleep, what direction we sleep, these things, it's too complicated to really get everything in the Shastra alone. Therefore, the Shastra advises you take shelter of the great souls and they will teach you. That is why there has to be a social manifestation of this shishtachara, because that is what carries this parampara in a lokic sense. It is not an individual, and it is not the shastra. It is not guru sadhu shastra. That's a radical statement, isn't it? But it is upheld by guru sadhu shastra, which is the real point, because it's so complex. You, 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 Krishna admits in Mahabharata when he's talking about this, not everything can be codified. It's not possible. Let's say, for example, uh, those who have just taken Brahminical initiation, now they're learning how to worship the deity. So somebody has to show you what to do. You can't just read a book. Somebody has to actually show you this thing. How do you play Murdanga? Great, you can get all the theory, fine, but you have to see how it actually works. Practical application. This thing you have to get through Lok Parampara, or Pitri Parampara, even we can say. It doesn't come anywhere else. Therefore, that has to be sustained. Anushtan, that Shishtachara is our duty in every generation to sustain that for the next generation because, as I said, one generation is all it takes, and it's lost, and Prabhupada said this. It is purport. He's, he's admitted that it's, it's already, you know, I don't want to say 90% lost, but if you figure that the bull of dharma is standing on one leg only, then you can do the math. <laughs> you know? And if you consider the... Just, let's take a Yomuna River as a case in point, because we've mentioned already. You know, just within the last 20 or 30 years, the Yomuna has become so polluted that you, you, you can't see through it. There's a two-foot high layer of uh, soap suds everywhere you go to try to take birth baths in the Yumana, and only a madman will do so. Even the Goswamis in the temples in Vrindavan do not use Yamuna gel to bathe the deity any longer because it's carcinogenic, and highly so. Farmers are dying all the way up and down the riverbanks between Delhi and Agra. Because of that, it's a massive problem and a very serious one, only, and it's only come about within the last few years. So just consider the trajectory that we've adopted and the the, the speed at which we're moving. You see? Therefore, Prabhupada gave 80% of his instructions on the topic of dharma in the last three years that he was with us, because he saw that his own disciples were having so many problems, problems with their marriages, problems with their initiation vows, problems with the philosophy, most of which are created by political ambitions, <laughs> right? It's like the Ritvik idea. I mean, it's not really philosophical, if you think about it. It's just an excuse for some political thing. So, civic, because that's the subject matter of another lecture, I think. But is that giving you some idea, is answering your question? You read the Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, very carefully. All these things are described by Krishna. Again, not the details, but the principles are given there. And the principles are not negotiable. The principles have to be followed. The details may change according to time, place, and circumstance. That is the function of the acharya. But the acharya also has to speak in terms of guru sadhu shastra and up uphold whatever adjustments he makes. That's another thing. Or his disciple has to do so if he's not here anymore. Is that okay? Any other questions or comments? Yeah. What, what is the origin of these desires and wanting? Like, 
it's different from person to person. Is there something with soul? Or? What is the origin of desires in, in an individual? Yeah. It's called anadi, anadi karma. Or it's called hrachaya, that, that thing which is lying in the heart since time immemorial. I mean, the, ori the origin, if you want to go back to the absolute origin, how many billions of kalpas ago, we can say the origin is this tendency that we have to be independent, since we're talking about independence. The notion that I can enjoy independently of the Supreme Lord, that is the cause of our fall down into material consciousness, into material existence. And once we're in material existence, then all we have to do is associate with it. You just have to be. <laughs> you simply have to exist and you will be contaminated in this material world. And whatever desires we got, who can trace them out? This is what I mentioned, karmana, gahana, gahana karmana goti. Krishna says, it's, it's, it's unfathomable, timeless process. But the principle we can understand and the solution we can also understand. So, you know, that's one explanation. Another explanation is that just like a person, especially if you live in Bangalore where there are so many pubs nowadays, ever since the invasion of the, uh, I should say, the neo-colonization of, of the transnational corporations, um, you know, the, the pubs have just increased in Bangalore. It's unbelievable. I, there's no city that I've seen this phenomenon as much as in Bangalore. All right, so you're walking down the street in Bangalore and you see one of these pubs and just, you know, from contemplating enough of them, you decide one day I'm going to go in and, and check it out. Yeah? That is the problem. That is the problem. Curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> That's where the desire comes from, because once you get in there, you get intoxicated, and then from all bets are off. You, you don't know what you're going to do after that. You see? What is the solution? The solution is satsanga. You take shelter of good association. You monitor your association, as she was mentioning, and you follow the authorities, because they've given you good advice how to do this, how to strategize with your material conditioning in this world. That information has been given, and a bona fide guru will know what to do when. Actually, Prabhupada said, intelligence simply means knowing what is what and who is who. <clears throat> and we're bewildered right now, because you know, either if we're in the mode of passion, then our desires bewilder the intelligence, because the, the, the desires won't let the intelligence hear anything that's right, and if we're in the mode of ignorance, then there, there's, there's not even that much elevation. It's just pure darkness, different flavors of darkness, pure bewilderment, you see? So we associate with things that are sat, people that are sat, activities that are sat, or sattvic in other words, things that are in the mode of goodness, things that emanate nobility and light and virtue and knowledge and awareness. You see, we have to associate with those things. Padram karne bhishnuyama deva. You should hear auspicious things. You should see auspicious things. Use all of your senses to elevate yourself while you can. Because this, last will not, this life will not last. Your senses will become too feeble to see the deity. Your ears will give it, will fail you, and you'll no longer be able to hear. What did he say? I took my mother's many times. I used to take my elderly mother before she passed away to the temple to hear the lectures. And she always appreciated, but she couldn't hear anything. She had so much trouble hearing. But, you know, by the time everything starts rotting while you're still in it, that's called old age, then you know, it's, it's pretty much too late. It's, you're going to need really an act of God to help you in that circumstance. Therefore, we have vidhis and we have nishedas, and a, and a person who is cultured and educated should follow them. And Krishna says this very thing in the end of chapter 16. Tasmat chastram pramanam te karya akarya vijanataha. You should dis discriminate what is, to do, what is to be done, what is not to be done on the basis of what the shastra says. Simple. Simple thing. It's very simple in the sense that it's not a complicated principle. It's very difficult in that its application is very complicated, 
but mainly because we have desires to do other things. This is the problem. It's not easy because we don't prioritize it. We, we, we've got our own independent ideas. Or as Prabhupada says here, concoction. He several times says, you know, he calls it different things in different places. Mental speculation, concoction, manufacturing, all these things. This is, this is what creates problems for us. Is that okay? Anything else? Yeah. Can you expand on the point that you made that we have to become uh, dependent in order to become independent? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. We have to become dependent in order to become independent. Because, here, let me just read what Prabhupada wrote. It's a very nice, there's a few purports here that are very nice. So, one of them is that, <coughs> I'm, ta I'm speaking from Canto 4, Chapter 9, Text 35. This is Dhruva Maharaj speaking. And he says, Because of my state of complete foolishness and paucity of pious activities, although the Lord offered me his personal service, I wanted material name, fame, and prosperity. My case is just like that of a poor man who when, satisfied, uh, when he satisfied a great emperor who wanted to give him anything he might ask, out of ignorance, asked only for a few broken grains of husk for rice. Now, in the purport, Prabhupada writes here. In this word, the, in this verse, the word swadajim, which means complete independence, is very significant. A conditioned soul does not know what complete independence is. Do you believe that? Should I read it again? <laughs> a conditioned soul does not know what complete independence is. We don't even know what independence is. We don't even know what it means to be independent. You think? The real and in complete independence means situation in one's own constitutional position. Do we know our own constitutional position? Raise your hand if you know your swarup. Siddhadeha. <laughs> well, we don't know anything. So what is the question of independence? The real independence of a living entity who is part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of God it is to always remain dependent on the Supreme Lord just like a child who plays in complete independence guided by his parents who watch over him. The child can, he can play in any way he wants as long as he's with the parents because they will, if he does something, he messes up, they will... And actually, that's 